ನಮೋ ತಸ್ ಭಗವತ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ನಮೋ ತಸ್ ಭಗವತ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ನಮೋ ತಸ್ ಭಗವತ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧ ಲಾಸ್ಟ್ ವೀಕ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ವಿ ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಟೆಡ್ ಅ ನ್ಯೂ ಸುತ್ತ ವಿಚ್ ಈಸ್ ಅವೈಲೇಬಲ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಮಜ್ಜಮಿನಿ ಕಾಯ ವಿಚ್ ಈಸ್ ದ ಟ್ವೆಂಟಿ ಏಟ್ ಸುತ್ತ ಆಫ್ ಮಂಜಮಿನಿ ಕಾಯ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿಚ್ ವಾಸ್ ರಿಸೈಟೆಡ್ ಬೈ ವೆನರಬಲ್ ಸಾರಿ ಪುತ್ತ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಕಾಲ್ ಮಹಾ ಹತ್ತಿ ಪದೋಪಮ ಸುತ್ತ ಸೊ ದ ಸಿಮಿಲಿ ಈಸ್ ದ ರೀಸನ್ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ದ ನೇಮ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಕಮ್ ಟು ದಿಸ್ ಪರ್ಟಿಕ್ಯುಲರ್ ಸುತ್ತ ಸೊ ದ ಸಿಮಿಲಿ ಗಿವನ್ ಈಸ್ ದ ಎಲಿಫೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಪುಟ್ರಿಟ್ now all as we all know the elephant is the largest animal and when we consider its footprint that is also the largest footprint so inside that elephant's footprint we can put any other animal's footprint so basically elephant's footprint is being the last being the largest so when it was hariputta mentioned similarly the four noble truths is the basic teaching of the buddha the most profound teaching of the buddha and uh, all the other teachings can be included inside this four noble truths so all the other wholesome states all the other teachings of the buddha can be included within this four noble truths so having said that now he is explaining the four noble truths starting with the noble truth of suffering and uh, he has given a brief introduction to the noble truth of suffering and then he start discussing it in detail and uh, he particularly start mentioning that the noble truth of suffering is the five clinging aggregates and they are the material form aggregate affected by clinging the feeling aggregate affected by clinging perception aggregate affected by clinging formations aggregate affected by clinging and the consciousness aggregate affected by clinging now after mentioning that now he hopes to explain one by one and uh, he starts with the rupakkhanda rupupadana khanda the form clinging aggregate or the material form aggregate which is affected by clinging and there he elaborate what it is chattari cha mahabhutani chaturnan cha mahabhutana upadaya rupa so they are the four great elements and the material derived from those four great elements and then he is asking what are the four great elements so they are the earth element water element fire element and the air element now he is going to explain the patavi dhatu and he mention patavi dhatu also two forms what is internal and then external now he is going to explain what is internal and that is where all the internally belonging to oneself is solid solidified and clung to and he is giving a 19 such examples head hair body hair nails teeth skin flesh sinews bones bone marrow etc so last time we discussed these things and uh, after giving a list he further mention apart from this whatever else internally belonging to oneself which is solid solidified and clung to this is called the internal earth element so this doesn't mean that these given examples only has only have earth element basically each and every body part has all the four elements but we can comparatively see the proportion of a element included in given list is very high therefore we can say they are more predominantly with the element therefore they are called but in general they are examples of earth element say for example even we know that a teeth a tooth is actually a more fixed kind of a form it doesn't mean it has no any kind of a watery characteristic because of its uh, watery characteristics that's why the all particles are very well bound together so the water characteristic is there that's why it is very well bound together 
and there is a certain temperature and again we can see maybe internally there is a little internally internal particles may be continuously moving which is not really apparent to us now basically all these different characteristics or all the four elements are available in whatever we can call as an object but what is proportionately very highly available causes it to consider as patavidhatu or apo tejo vahyu now we are talking on patavidhatu so all these examples given have that characteristics they their majority proportion is using the earth element because of the earth element now after he explains that he further mentioned now both internal earth element and external earth element are simply earth element now as we discussed last week so now here actually a given list is there and uh, just for us to have a sense and we practically when we are practicing so we can actually make use of this list so that our mind get uh, fairly concentrated fairly collected into the body and into these uh, various body parts so that's a very interesting type of meditation so we are going through different parts of the body paying attention again and again so ultimately the result is that uh, we may thoroughly understand it is not a a kind of a solid compact type of body it consists of various body parts it's a combination of many part many parts it is not something a solid unit as such but it is something made up with so many little little parts so then that the ghana sanya the wrong wave of compactness will be diminished and further as we are continuing there may be element characteristics we may be able to recognize say for example if you touch your hand there is a hardness there may be softness there may be roughness there may be smoothness and in your hand you might feel its weight so all the earth characteristics are there so more we associate the body these earth characteristics become more evident and as we continue our practice now we don't need to put any labels this has head hair body hair teeth nails etc rather we can simply recognize the elements so they are our practice become more intensified but with reduced unnecessary perceptions now earth element has become more evident directly known while all conventional names what we have given to these different body parts for our recognition are all abandoned now the mind has certain simplicity but still it has some penetrative wisdom because it is it has become well concentrated and so again we are doing it mindfully with a balanced effort so there are there is a potential for various insights to arise and when those insights are present it is not limited to this internal body you can apply it even to the outside inferentially and they are venerable sariputta highlights yacheva kopana ajjatika patavidhatu yacha bahira patavidhatu patavidhatu revesa so whatever you call internal earth element and whatever we call external earth element are simply merely earth element so these boundaries internal external so these are merely human made mind made boundaries so once those are eliminated so we can see in general everywhere the earth element so basically the all four elements are there now we are talking about the earth element so you may understand okay whatever we call internal earth element whatever we call external earth element are merely earth element so that boundary internal external boundary being very much like abandoned so mind become evenly spreaded and on the other hand mind once once it understood this true reality it becomes dispassionate about the earth element 
So earth element is not something to be associated, not something to be clung to. Rather, now mind has some thorough understanding about the earth element. So as a result of that, it is being very much like relinquished. And Buddha further mentioned, and that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus this is not mine this is this i am not this is not myself with respect to different body parts different external objects whatever we call material none of them is not can be recognized using this phrase this is not mine this i am not this is not myself so typically strong recognition is the body recognition where we recognize body as a unit body as something compact and on top of that body has a self so we are having sakkaditti with respect to body so that is one of the most strong type of sakkaditti we consider this body is me myself or inside the body there is a self or within the self there is this body so likewise different possibilities are there for the personality view sakkaditti to produced so that is how we live that is how the whole society operates so that we are identified using our body using our external photographs and that is actually how we recognize how we identify with the body but when one practicing the elements meditation this uh, misunderstanding slowly abandoned so he now has a kind of a thorough comprehensive understanding about the earth element water fire air basically spreaded all around the universe so therefore he can't grasp it now he can't call it as me myself so he slowly slowly abandons his this kind of an attachment so when one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element now in order to emphasize this whole story uh, when bal sariputta further explain how impermanent it is the great external earth element now he is giving a simile now there comes a time when the water element is disturbed and then the external earth element vanishes now there is a such time now he is predicting it is possible this is going to happen and when even this external earth element great as it is is seen to be impermanent subject to destruction disappearance and change what of this body which is clung to by craving and last but a while there can be no considering that as i o mine o i am if we consider this whole earth it is so massive and still there is a time ultimately this whole earth going to be destroyed this earth external earth element going to be destroyed and uh, if such vast external earth element destroys then no point of talking about this little weak internal earth element it is also subject to impermanence it is also subject to destruction it is also subject to disappearance and change by reflecting like this he basically emphasize the non self and on the other hand we can say promotes dispassion so when we understand the non governability of the earth element or once we understand its impermanence either momentary level you can understand its uh, impermanence and on the large scale you can understand the impermanence of this whole earth then internal earth element also has the same characteristics it is also impermanent it is also unstable it is also not producing enough satisfaction and it is also even though it appear like solid internally there is nothing substantial internally there is nothing anything kind of important so as we discussed last time when someone is practicing the hatuman sikara so he can actually recognize 
the manifestation of the earth element and uh, which helps for him to understand its true nature and as a result of that slowly slowly his mind become dispassionate about the earth element so he is not ready now to consider it as me myself or i am so i mine or i am so his mind has become somewhat detached from the whole body it doesn't mean that he won't feel it he may be feeling it but still there is no attachment there is no grasping body is operating on its own and the mind has become somewhat dispassionate now he further give a another area so that is with respect to patience in a way so when others abuse revile scold and harass so he mentioned that the bhikkhu whoever the person practicing may understand this painful feeling born of ear contact has a reason in me this is how this uh, story has happened so even though someone is abusing someone is scolding harassing still how this has happened is because of the painful feeling born of ear contact so ear contact is the cause ear is there sounds are there so once they are aligned then we can say the ear consciousness happen so this process repeats and then we perceive it like three things ear sound and the ear consciousness so this cause to produce the pass the contact and then contact causes feelings now this is how actually i am experiencing this painful feeling even though they are talking harassing abusing but ultimately what happen is this kind of a process whatever the sound has hit the ear drum that's again a kind of physical activity as a result of that ear consciousness has arisen so when this process repeats we perceive it as coming together of three objects that is the sound ear and the eye, ear consciousness so this causes the contact to happen contact causes feeling so buddha sorry venerable sariputta further turns our attention now to the impermanence he is telling he is telling that this contact is impermanent that feeling is impermanent that perception is impermanent that formations are impermanent and that consciousness is impermanent now if we consider this little scenario where someone and someone's abuse come and hit the ear drum we hear it so basically that whatever the ear whatever that contact whatever that sound all that are impermanent so the all those all belong to the form aggregate sound ear are uh, belong to the form aggregate so that's impermanent and he further highlights that contact also impermanent feeling also impermanent perception is also impermanent formations are also impermanent the consciousness that is the here the ear consciousness and later it may be the mind consciousness all consciousness are also impermanent so he is turning our attention into the impermanence so that uh, uh basically he is not taking things personally rather he is knowing things with wisdom what we have derived through his practice so he has practiced uh, elements meditation and uh, is using that wisdom or we can say the insight knowledge to abandon whatever the kind of uh, uneasy feeling or little uh, angry feeling which is arising because of the abusing he is now using to abandon that kind of anger so he is putting his understanding of elements into the practice so this is actually very important because we consider sometimes so elements meditation we are practicing only at the monastery only at the 
say sitting meditation or at a retreat level and then we are not really getting its benefit at large scale so if we know what we are experiencing how this whole physical experience is happening so that understanding that insight knowledge can be applied to various life situations now he is giving one example here so when someone is abusing when someone is scolding so can we use the knowledge that we have gathered through our elements meditation practice to that scenario can we use that understanding to abandon the anger so similarly we can talk about when lust is arising suppose that you are looking at a beautiful sight and as a result of that suppose lust is arising that is also happening because of contact now all that are impermanent contact is impermanent sight is impermanent the feeling is impermanent the perception impermanent so whatever the thoughts are arising that those are also impermanent and different consciousness that also impermanent so when he is seeing like this so his mind becomes somewhat dispassionate not interested about the whatever that incident anymore as a result of this passion so mind slowly resides at decides at seclusion so basically uh, so this understanding these insight knowledge we can apply to day to day activities and keep the mind fairly relaxed without making it burn and he is giving another simile another sort of uh, situation so he being attacked by something more disagreeable maybe with fists maybe clods sticks knives so this is a more more uh, gross kind of an attack previously it is kind of a speech related attack abusing but here it is more a physical attack now even this once this physical attack is considered so they are and the sariputta mentioned this body is of such a nature that contact with fists clods sticks and knives assail it so because this body is so gross it is made up using these elements so it is very fragile on one hand and on the other hand it is very much like at a risk because at any given moment any of these uh, physical other objects can hit this body so he is trying to give a perception rather than finding fault with the others he is now very much like coming back to us they are hitting because this body has the nature of this solidity because it is solid because it is with more into the uh, earth element so whenever someone is hitting using his fists or clods or sticks or knives whatever so they come and hit the body so he is very much like uh, rather than attributing the whole situation to an outside person and being angry now he is trying to see a way to overcome anger by turning it inside so this body has the nature so that is where the issue so now you even further become dispassionate about the body rather than finding fault with the others so he is you are recognizing okay this body is made up with like that suppose that uh, your body is completely transparent and it is not uh, so solid so then if someone use his fists or clods or sticks whatever it may not really hit the body because there is no any such kind of a very gross solid type of material body it may be a very refined type of body then we can't say when someone is hitting it may hit the body because it is so refined but unfortunately this body what we have as humans is very gross very hard type of body so easily so these external solid objects can attack this body so on the other hand now he is reminding us the simile of the saw 
කකචූපමෝවාද this is a very well known uh, simile what buddha has given to the monks kakachup in kakachupam sutta we are so he is giving the simile even if bandits were to se- severe you are savagely limb by limb with a two handled saw he who gave rise to a mind of hate towards them would not be carrying out my teaching so this is the kind of extreme case but this using as a way to encourage in a way we can say the in type of uh, patience and on the other hand to avoid any kind of an anger growing in our mind so anger has to be abandoned so it is not an easy task so that's why many methods are explained to abandon anger just by merely practicing metta meditation it's very unlikely that uh, we are going to completely abandon anger so metta meditation is helpful to temporarily subsess sub kind of subside anger but in order to eliminate anger again and again so we need these kind of reflections and which are really based on wisdom so once you know the elements their true nature so it's giving a some sort of a perspective which is more capable of looking at things more deeply he also we already discussed so this body has a nature of solidity so whatever external solid objects can come and hit the body and uh, further after mentioning about the simile of the saw this particular monk whoever the person uh, trying to develop the practice is able to abandon whatever that craving or whatever that uh, anger arising in the mind so he basically when the sariputta basically explain how this particular person has to think so tireless energy shall be aroused in me an unremitting mindfulness established my body shall be tra- shall be tranquil and untroubled my mind concentrated and un- unified and now let contact with this fists clods sticks and knives assail this body for for this teaching of the buddha is being practiced by me so he is giving more emphasis to the practice rather than finding fault with another one and going to argument or going to any conflict now he is with himself even though someone is abusing verbally even though someone is hitting physically still he is turning things inside keeping the mind quiet keeping the mind unattached keeping the mind free from any defilement and further he gives another area so when someone is reflecting about the buddha dhamma sangha so he mentioned that his mind has to establish in equanimity now this is actually another area which might uh, useful because you know once we practice satipatthan more and more the mind become dispassionate more and more mind understand the true nature that's why it become dispassionate and as this process continues so his mind become temporarily released it is released to the amount of wisdom what we have tadanga nibbuti quench to that level if we have a very strong thorough understanding about the true nature to that level a strong relinquishment a strong detachment would arise then it's easy that for us to abandon the body abandon in the sense that to relinquish the body to avoid any kind of grasping to this body not only body even to the outside external objects we can avoid any kind of grasping because we have seen the true nature we understood its uh, impermanent nature its unsatisfactory nature non governable nature or we can say intrinsically there is no anything substantial so that empty nature someone has understood now once that is there it may cause the mind to release without attaching to things without grasping things now the point is uh, this yogi is now trying to maintain that equanimity 
that release state of mind etan santan etan panitan yaddan upekha so this equanimity towards all the formations is very sublime serene peaceful so let me continue this let me maintain my attention into this uh, very subtle relaxed calm equanimous sublime kind of a state which is possible as we practice the elements meditation or the satipatthana practice now once it is there assume that the mind shifts to something else again certain past memories are coming the future plans are coming again some conventional stuff are coming so the result is again the mind shift it loses this balance it loses that previous simplicity it loses that previous equanimity and it again go and tangle with something assume that once that tanglement has happened now buddha or rather the venerable sariputta is mentioning a criteria to take it back so that is the way that he is mentioning here recollects the buddha dhamma and the sangha so by reminding the buddha dhamma sangha recollecting the buddha dhamma da- sangha so if if his mind abandon this new grasped state of mind and come back or revert back to that simplicity unattached simplicity then that is good but if it is not so that means he has to arouse more energy he has to have more urgency now he is giving a little simile here so in this traditional environment so when a uh, a woman is going and uh, living with his hus- with her husband so there are other relatives inside this house there is the father in law there is the mother in law maybe brother in law sister in laws so it's a family actually unlike in the today's terms so in the traditional society so this is a large family is there so this uh, new girl new woman is now coming to that uh, family as the daughter in law now this is a new place for her actually it is not much familiar with and it's a new place for her and there are elders there are unknown people who are not yet familiar with now she is having some sort of a uh, sense of urgency so he is she is actually being very careful not to make any fault because this is her husband's family so once she comes to this her husband's family now particularly he she is careful about the father in law because she, he is typically considered as the the household so this we are talking of the traditional east uh, family background so this is the model typically we have so father is the chief of the family and mother daughter are very much under his supervision and so this is the t- typical traditional family background here we are talking now to that family when a uh, daughter in law is coming so the the husband is actually has his father already available so this father is actually still the governing per governing body we can say in today's terms he is the administrator now when this daughter in law comes to the house so she also has to abide by this uh, kind of a scenario kind of hierarchy so she also has to adapt to this system so particularly with respect to father in law she has to arouse urgency be more respectful if there is any kind of a family tradition that has to be followed with if there are any customs that she has to adhere to so all that she has to concern now telling this uh, simile so what venerable sariputta wants to highlight is that the monk whenever he remembers about the buddha dhamma sangha it should be very much like how that daughter in law remembers the father in law 
because then she quickly comes back to her senses and become more sensible maintaining her manners establish mindfulness all that is there when she remembers her father in law so similarly the monk has to have some sort of respect kind of an honor towards the buddha dhamma sangha so when such remembrance when such recollection of the buddha dhamma sangha happens if his mind establish back in that equanimity so that is good that is expected in a way so if it is not happening basically when the sadhu put the mention here if it is not happening then it is a loss for me it is a loss for this particular monk it is a loss for me it is no gain for me it is bad for me it is not good for me when i thus recollect the buddha dhamma and sangha equanimity supported by the whole sum does not become established in me so when i am reflecting the buddha dhamma sangha if my mind withdraw from any other sensual desire or any anger or any kind of other entanglement and revert back to the simplicity revert back to that unattached equanimity so that is the expected result according to the hariputta if it is not happening so that means still i don't have such kind of a urgency i don't have that such kind of a respect towards the buddha dhamma sangha so here actually we can remember if you can remember this uh, indriya bhavana sutta so in indriya bhavana sutta to the typical practitioner buddha is giving three situations or three strategies to revert back to that simplicity to revert back to that equanimity olarikam sankatam padisampanna so whenever he was in that equanimity suppose that there is a shifting happen so mind go and uh, establish that something else some kind of a distraction and as a result of that mind get agitated and now the mind has become again somewhat conditioned colored and now he has to revert back so there are three possibilities i mean not only three possibilities but some possibilities are there so three buddha mentioned in the indriya bhavana sutta so the monk has to reflect okay this is kind of a gross state what i am currently in i was in a very subtle very relaxed state so he, when reflecting like that his mind may nat- naturally incline towards that relaxed state another case is that understanding the conditioned nature sankatam of this uh, new state so as a result of that again he is able to revert back to that old equanimous state the other case buddha mentioned there is the padisampanna nature so how it is dependently arisen so when one reflects how things are dependently arisen again he is able to revert back to that old present equanimity now interestingly for a seeka puggala for a trainee buddha give a different situation so when a trainee is practicing still his mind can shift it to something else rather than maintaining his mind at this equanimity unattached non grasping state still there may be a possibility that his mind go and grasp but uh, there are the recommended practices simply attiyati harayati jigucchati so he simply mention okay you don't need to you are simply being ashamed of what has happened because you thoroughly understood the true nature of the phenomena their impermanence their unsatisfactoriness their non self nature but still the mind has become fooled still the mind has subjected to a old habit now you feel ashamed of it ashamed of what has happened so that aroused shame would be enough for you to revert back to the old peaceful equanimous state so it's very much like such scenario that venbar sadiputta is also explaining here so whenever the mind has shifted to any kind of a grasping so he is saying okay now you have to reflect about the buddha dhamma sangha now that urgency that respect 
that uh, sort of uh, shame would arise in your mind so it automatically shifts back to the equanimity like a daughter-in-law thinking about her father-in-law again she comes to her senses she become more restrained maintaining her manners composed etc so similarly buddha say the monk has to reflect the buddha masanga so that he will revert back to the equanimity rather than maintaining any kind of a attached agitated type of state and uh, when he is reflecting buddha dhamma sangha immediately if his mind revert back to the equanimity then that is a gain then it is a it is something good for me so you can see so this is how he basically uh, explain how to practice with respect to the earth element now this i mean it's a kind of a long story long description given in one sense he is talking about the dukkha arya satcha the noble truth of suffering and there he is talking about the five aggregates starting with the four aggregate four aggregates are the four elements starting with the solid earth element and now he is talking how to practice with the earth element and he is giving examples to the earth element using the body and after going through the practice his mind become dispassionate because internal earth element and external earth element are very similar and now the mind has released from the earth element and now how are we going to further maintain that unattached state non grasping state and he is giving some reflections so whenever the mind become angry so one case is he is trying to take back our understanding about the elements so we already understood the nature the true nature of the elements so whenever sound hits the eardrum no such thing has happened so you are reverting back to the equanimity another scenario is when the body being hit by something solid maybe it through a weapon or club or something stick etc again you are reflecting using the elements particularly the solid element and reverting back to the equanimity and on the other hand you can reflect about the simile of the so which buddha has mentioned kakachupa mohada and that also will help back help us to revert back to the equanimity rather than going into any anger another case is that he is ref- asking us to reflect about the buddha dhamma sangha and then again you become shameful about what has happened that you have shifted back to um, why why you have come to this uh, agitated state so when you reflect about the buddha dhamma sangha you establish urgency and revert back to the equanimity so these are the methods actually when bel sariput uh, explains here and we'll go into the other uh elements later and with that i like to conclude today's sutta teaching session now i like to open the session for questions yeah thank you sanjay sadhu 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 so we have a question from our side when the dhamma vijita going to explain yes yes bante thank you for your teaching and um <coughs> pardon me <coughs> I I wanted to make one statement and then I have one question um that is um it, you mentioned that the most basic level we cling to a sense of self mm-hmm. and um that's our mo- that's our strongest mm. uh clinging to mm-hmm. the sense of self mm-hmm. and I just wanted to make a statement that um and this is a challenging the buddha or anything but but at the most basic level that sense of self that we cling to as a survival mm-hmm. instinct to mm-hmm. help us survive mm-hmm. um so i just wanted to make that statement um and that it's a very interesting thing to consider mm-hmm. uh, i was just thinking about how um uh, i think that is why you can agree because that is the baba tanha <laughs> Baba Tanha. Clinging to Cl- existence. Existence. Yes. Clinging to because because we we want to continue without yes. di- without dying. 
Yes. <laughs> and, and it's interesting because the Buddha is encouraging us ultimately to mm. surpass uh, even that becoming again mm. or existing again. Mm. So it's very interesting. So even to understand that instinctual desire mm. to exist has to be abandoned. Yes. <laughs> and um, it can help us live a much more wholesome life mm. if we're uh, not clinging to the self so much. Mm. And uh, ultimate wholesomeness is mm. just to be Relinquish. free. Be free. Um, mm. Mm. But um, I had one question. Um, you were speaking of um, letting go of or, or uh, establishing equanimity. Mm-hmm. And um, Bhikkhu Bodhi mentions that this is a wholesome equanimity. Mm-hmm. Do you agree with yes, that? Yes, yes, definitely. So I'm, my question is, what is an un- unwholesome equanimity? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would be interested mm-hmm. to know what that No, is. one thing is now, rather than, yeah, maybe we can consider it also as unwholesome. So mm-hmm. there may be an equanimity based on ignorance. Okay. Now here what we are talking is more uh, equanimity with, based on wisdom. So mm-hmm. the, ba- the equanimity based on ignorance is where you become inactive, mm-hmm. maybe a little lethargic. So particularly you are, you are unable to do anything because you are in a very weak, timid kind of stage. So to try and kind of avoid... Withdraw yourself. Withdraw you are not doing anything and you become equanimous. Maybe out of fear. Out, maybe out of fear. Now, different reasons are there. <clears throat> Actually, one reason is the fear. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. you feel you are, you are very weak, you are very feeble and the other part is very strong. Yeah. And you can't make any action, so you become equanimous. The other case is maybe you are quite ignorant. So what's really going on, you don't know. So you, at a situation when you have to take an action, you don't know whether it is the correct position or correct time to take the action because you are widely ignorant. So you still maintain the equanimity. So there may be a situation that you, you have to quickly react, but you don't know about it. You are unaware of it because of the ignorance. So you still maintain that equanimity. So there, those are actually ignorance, ignorance-based type of equanimity actually helps to grow ignorance, basically. Okay. So okay. that's why probably you can remember when Venerable, so this uh, Dhammadinna explaining the equanimous feelings. Mm. So when we are not knowing the proper cause of the equanimity or we are not properly handling the equanimity, she is telling, okay, we are producing or promoting the latent tendency of avijja. Avijja uh, Anuse. So okay. we are promoting that Avijja Anuse. Mm. So with respect to the uh, pleasurable feelings, we are promoting ignorantly using this uh, what we call the lustful nature of the mind, the Raga Anuse. With respect to painful feelings, when we are you know uh, going through a painful feeling with you know a lot of mental agony and distress. So then we are promoting what we call the patiga anusaya, the latent tendency to anger. And with respect to the equanimous feelings, when we are ignorantly continuing it, we are producing or we are promoting the ignorance. Okay. So, so there may be a situation that people are ignorant and they still maintain, as a result of that, they are maintaining very kind of inactive state of mind, which is also equanimous, but it is not the proper, proper equanimity. But here the point is, so by going through vipassana practice, you have understood their true nature. So they are impermanent, they are unsatisfactory. Intrinsically, there is no any core, any, anything substantial and things are beyond my control. And as a result of that practice, your mind has completely shifted out of the phenomena. So basically the mind has let go of the phenomena totally. It is not you are holding any kind of a view. It is not that you are holding any kind of object, rather the mind has become completely objectless, given up the things, detached from the things, released from the things. So this is the equanimity we are talking here now. It's a more profound kind of an equanimity we are talking here. So therefore I can definitely agree with what Bhikkhu Bodhi mentioned. It's a wholesome equanimity we are talking, which is more based on the wisdom. Okay. Hmm. 
Is there a sutta that talks about this unwholesome equanimity that you're uh, mentioning? The, this high avoiding and... I think I have heard, I have learned that, mm, I can't exactly remember the name. Uh, yes, there are suttas talking about it. That would be interesting. Yeah, yeah. But I can't remember immediately what is the sutta which is talking about the ignorant kind of equanimity. But certainly I have read it. Yeah. Okay. I have a vague remembrance about it. I may well just yeah, search that yeah. I'm yes, yes. Access to insiders. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they yeah. <laughs> uh, unwholesome equanimity. Yeah, yeah. It's not uh, exactly mentioning as the unwholesome equanimity. Uh, so they are. Uh, is, there a after, poly, is there a poly word? Uh, Akusala. <laughs> not, not Akusala, it's called. Uh, can't remember. I I'll, I'll try to figure it out. I can't now remember. Okay. But somewhere, so Buddha explains uh, what is the ignorant kind of equanimity. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back to you, Jennifer. Okay. Thank you, Pante. Uh, I'd like to invite Jennifer to share her question. Yes. Um, I I think I have um, switched on, aren't I? You can hear me, Bante? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, Bante, um, I have come across this little bit of confusion quite often where it says five aggregates Mm -hmm. affected by clinging. Mm -hmm. So each time I read it, I have to quickly translate it to something else in my mind which says five aggregates which are the basis of clinging. Mm Mm-hmm than affected by clinging. Um, that makes more sense to me. And I'm just wondering if other people have a similar sort of problem with that mm-hmm. way of trans- so, so can yeah. you explain a little bit more about the difference? Um, yes, when it says affected by clinging, it is as if the clinging affects the aggregates. Mm-hmm. Whereas it's the aggregates that we cling to, uh, it's the basis of our clinging. Mm-hmm. It's what leads to clinging. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a, just in my mind. It's mm-hmm. a, it seems more accurate, but I'm, I'm che- checking with you whether right. that's so. That's uh, a that's right. inter- yeah. That's an interesting sutta. You can refer in uh, Khanda Sangyutta, which is called Punnama Sutta, uh, full moon full yeah. moon sutta, Punnama Sutta in the Khanda Sangyutta. Yeah. Actually, we discussed this in the Kalalgoda meditation retreat. So, there are one monk is asking a series of questions. Actually, altogether, there are 10 questions he is asking from the Buddha related to these aggregates. Yeah. And he is making a question. So, is Bhante clinging and aggregates are entirely different or are they similar? So, he is asking this kind of a question. So, Buddha replies telling that Clinging and aggregates are not entirely different and also they are not really similar. So he simply mentioned, so whatever you have this lustful attachment, what we call the Nandiraga or uh, Chandaraga actually, the desirous kind of attachment towards the aggregates is what we call the Upadana. So therefore this Upadana basically is... Uh, we can't say it is exactly entirely different from the aggregate so we can't say they are the aggregates so typically we can say this is a kind of something unnecessary we are having towards the aggregates this is the kind of desirous desirous type of attachment we are having to aggregates so on the other hand we can say assume that when someone becomes an arahant so he still continues his existing aggregates, but without any attachment. Mm. Yeah. Say, so, so for example, he he still lives. <coughs> he still feels certain feelings are there, perceptions maybe they are, but he does not attach to any of them. Yeah. His body continues. His body is actually the part of the the form aggregate. But there is no any attachment, there is no any kind of a clinging or any kind of a wrong view telling this body is me, myself, etc. 
so the aggregates are operating the clinging part is disappeared right so it's how we relate relate to the aggregate there's yeah. an interaction there yeah yeah that's the problem yeah because we can we are okay, not bank. we are we are not entirely away from the aggregates in the sense that uh, so we are the aggregates currently operating say we are when we are eating something okay there is a feeling and we still he still recognize the food so recognition part is also there so certain volitional activities are also there the formation aggregate is also there and say we are uh, we are going to some Uh, tongue consciousness maybe even mind consciousness so all that consciousness part is also there the body and the food belongs to the form aggregate everything is there now all these aggregates are operating but we either we are going to have any kind of an attachment any desire any greediness any grasping or we are completely keeping the mind without any such greediness grasping attachment is depending on our practice isn't it right yes yeah yes the mind interacts differently differently in situation yes. it's yes. not matching yes yes yes, yes. okay bhante yeah, thank yeah, you yeah yeah okay thank you i like to invite nandana for the next question Bhante, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, my question is also about uh, the five aggregates. Right. Uh, Bhante, you know, in Venerable Sariputta explained uh, how one needs to weave when there's a feeling. Mm-hmm. One needs to contemplate that this feeling arose because there was contact, mm-hmm. uh, consciousness and, and form and and then the contact arose and and that is how the feeling arose yeah uh so i was kind of thinking when i was listening to that now five aggregates when they are mentioned they are mentioned as uh, rupa vedana sanya sankara uh, vinyan uh, mm-hmm. uh in that order mm-hmm. uh, but it it appears to me like as if consciousness although mentioned last mm-hmm. it actually it comes into play within our human experience mm. the consciousness comes into play at a very uh, initial stage mm. the moment we start experiencing something with our senses correct uh, actually we can say like this now if we want to go to the very orderly structure what is explained in the dhamma we can refer the madupindika sutta how venerable maha kachana giving the explanation चक्कुंच पटिच रूपे च उपाजे चक्कु विज्ञान तीन संगति पशु पशुपच्य वेदना सो एस रिस अलइनमेंट वि ई विथ सम सॉर्ट ऑफ अ फॉर्म वि ई कॉन्शियस्ट अरइज सो दिस हॉल प्रोसेस रिपीट अगेन एंड अगेन एंड ऑल टूगेदर नाउ वी कंसिडर इट एस अ कंटैक्ट नाउ द मैंड एंड बॉडी बोथ गेटिंग इनवाल एंड एस रिस दैट द फीलिंग गोइंग टू अरइज and young way this and sanjanaati so now you are trying to recognize this feeling the recognition part is also going to arise so therefore there is a such kind of a orderly fashion it is explained but the interesting thing is these things are happening extremely quickly now for our clarity these explanations are given but which is very difficult for us to see how step by step these things are happening inside the mind because things are happening instantaneously actually the all five aggregates are happening together and certain aggregates are more prominent so when we are talking about the kaya anupassana we are giving more emphasis towards the form aggregate and when we are considering the feeling the, the, the vedana anupassana we are giving more emphasis towards the feeling aggregate but it doesn't mean that the form aggregate is not present or the other aggregates are not present they are also present but what is more prominent what is more applicable to us is the feeling aggregate so likewise at a given moment at a given occasion we are giving some emphasis to a particular aggregate still the others are also operating in the background right right 
Yes, yeah, that's yeah, that 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 is very clear now. Yes, yeah. Uh, but what I was thinking is that the the consciousness mm. to me that appears as consciousness aggregate mm-hmm. is present with no matter at what stage of the the process we are in. Like for mm-hmm. example, some. Sankar, right? Sankar. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Sankar is like that involves some kind of an intention or kind of willful kind of thinking on our part. Mm-hmm. Is that correct, Bhante? Yeah. Right. So even at that stage, for us to do that, will willing or like forming an intention, mm-hmm. there should be consciousness, right? Consciousness must be at play even at that stage. Definitely. Yeah. Okay, so that's what I because I, I'm I'm trying to understand how how this this works in practice because I mm-hmm. I find it very interesting that uh, you know like yeah I like to, I to sit yeah I like to say like this now say for example assume that uh, there were nothing in the mind now there are certain mental object appear in the mind and when that mental object appear in the mind you immediately become aware of it. So rather than allowing that object to let go, you, so your mind start little reacting to that object. So this is the function of the sankhara khanda. So you start fabricating it, you start preparing it, adding to it, multiplying it, etc., etc. So at one given moment, so this makes kind of a momentum that you have to act on it. So you are now making a strong intention. Okay, you are using your hand, your voice, so mouth, so etc. Now you the six senses are into operation. So basically, avijja pacha sankara in that order. So the when name and form and consciousness are in operation. So when the moment that the consciousness get tangled with the name and form, there is a situation that it may trigger the six senses to operate at a given moment. Once that momentum has grown to a certain extent, it triggers the six senses to operate. Yes. 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 Right. So the yes. consciousness and so, name uh, and form are very intrinsically, you know, they have to operate. Operate. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that begs the question. Yeah. Bhante, now consciousness is is like a primary knowing hmm. of an experience like mm-hmm. whether or now or whatever right the consciousness mm-hmm. immediately arises at that moment with one whatever the senses that give us the signal or you know the bring us the the sense experience mm-hmm. but then we we also when we are mindful we have a state of mind that is called mindfulness sati mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now with sati what happens is we become aware of that consciousness right mm-hmm. that mm-hmm that earlier experience that we had with our consciousness mm-hmm. and now you become aware of that with mm-hmm. our mindfulness mm-hmm. so so I, I was kind of curious i mean so it almost looks like sati is totally outside the these all these things like consciousness and everything because it has to be something outside or something different for it, it to be able to see or become aware of that experience that we are having with consciousness. Uh, actually, we can say like uh, now the function of the consciousness is typically explained as vijanati. Vijanati means distinctly aware of or distinctly cognize. Suppose there are many objects and when yeah. among these many objects you particularly pay attention to a single thing and then you particularly pay attention to that. So distinctly knowing while many things are there, so that is the one important function of the consciousness. So you are capable of distinctly knowing various characteristics, distinctly knowing various attributes. So this is sort of the inherent, very primordial type of action what the consciousness is showing. Now interesting thing is, now say... uh, once practicing vipassana, suppose we start dropping the objects. We are not attaching to any object. Whatever come into our come into the conscious area, we start dropping things. And suppose there is a situation 
we are not attached into anything so that everything oh. is dropped yes. everything is dropped so the mind yes. become empty and no object oh. it becomes objectless but still awareness is there <laughs> yes awareness yes. is there so but still it doesn't yes. have any particular object to establish with So that's yeah, why that's, some, so, that's so, why we typically yeah, that's, mean, that's a very interesting uh, yeah, state yeah. of mind I yes, yes. I have actually I was about to talk about that actually but <laughs> it's like if you sit down and 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 you know just not fix your consciousness on yeah, anything like you exactly. it's almost as if I mean you feel as if this full like your kind of bank yeah yeah exactly so that's why so that is it's why we blank. call it like yeah and it's yeah. just bank and and you don't so you feel as if you're almost in control of your consciousness because exactly. you're not you're not allowing the consciousness to uh, land on anything exactly you just make exactly. it's almost like a, the way i experienced uh, it was like almost like a like a balloon huh. and you know you just pump air into it and just make it bigger and push everything else outside so you're kind of in that balloon. it's very interesting yeah, yeah. yes yes exactly. i understand what you said yes yeah so that is where it is called unestablished consciousness apatittita vijnana where there is no object for it to land upon so as you correctly mentioned it is not landed on anything it is not stated on uh, situated on anything it is not established yes. on anything and but still it, the knowing characteristic is there it is not completely yeah. unconscious right yes bante thank yeah. you very much thank yeah, you so yeah. uh, so much yeah, yeah. and uh, <laughs> also bante you mentioned about the the three ways of uh uh of come kind of coming back to uh your your uh, you know that blank kind of awareness yeah. kind of thing yeah uh from the indri bhavana sutta like yes, yes. olarika uh patit samappanna and there's another one sankhata sankhata sankata yes. now sankata you say now i understand the uh, patich sampanna and and olarika yeah but the 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 you said uh, the sankata is like condition mm-hmm. are you can you please explain it a little bit more to understand what it now, how it now say when you are talking about now we just talked about this unestablished consciousness where it is uh, nothing is there basically mind is very spacious hmm? and mind is maintaining it's very much like its original characteristic but uh, for us to be angry now we need to have certain kind of mental images about someone and maybe his face and maybe his acts etc and now we start uh, sort of preparing them in a certain fashion so that ultimately anger would arise so we do this fabrication part so the sankata means that this fabrication is there this construction has happened so as a result of that this anger has arisen so the anger is a constructed situation it is not an unconditioned type of unconstructed situation it is it's a more a fabricated situation we have made we have prepared it we have used various constructed or we have used various constructs to prepare it we have added certain thoughts to it we have used certain memories to it we have add certain past memories to it thoughts are there images are there this and that are there then we have prepared a huge something then we are angry so this angry situation is something constructed conditioned oh. right but 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 paticca uh, samuppanna also means something like that right because of that this happens yeah is it how is it different from paticca no, samuppanna no, no. it is, it is, is not contradictory no it is not contradicting or it's not different so here we are not paying any orderly fashion when we are talking about the constructed nature condition nature we are not much uh, talking about the orderly fashion how this depends on that this depends on that this, this depends on that we are not talking about that rather we simply in general how the new situation has arisen so we simply understand okay this 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 things have come together and you know i did a kind of a fabrication so this is my own additions are there my own likes and dislikes are mixed up so as a result of that this has happened 
but ah, when okay. but when you are talking about the what is open nature so as you said okay we may be going to the sort of very sort of uh, conditioned nature so as a result of the i then the uh, form then the i consciousness arise and then the contact arise contact causes the feeling feeling causes the craving craving causes upadana the clinging clinging causes the uh, this uh, becoming process the being the bhava then this whole mass of suffering has arisen the ag- agitation has come to be probably you can remember in the loka samudaya so we discussed this uh, in the kachanagatta sutta so buddha explained this how the loka samudaya happen chakkuncha paticca rupe jupadi chakku vinyanam tinna sangati passo passa paccha vedana vedana paccha tanha tanha paccha upadana so likewise the condition nature how dependently arisen dukkha happens with respect to each and every sense faculty so we can i mean if someone yeah, is so interested yeah, yeah yeah go ahead i'm sorry go ahead go ahead yeah i was trying to say i think i understand uh, so patich sopanna is almost like a universal way of have things uh, taking place yes, because yes. of this this happens because of this that happens and yeah. it is common to everybody Correct. whereas uh, sankata uh, is like depends on the person how that person has thought how that person has formed intentions and created his own uh, way of uh, you know his own state of mind right Uh, actually so even even the pari saupan pari saupan the nature also ultimately as a result of our practice it has to change now the certain part may be common so till till vedana it is very common so after vedana why we are making craving on top of onto it so that is the area that we need to work so when feelings are happening are we able to let them go without attaching to them without craving to them so that is the area we have to practice right right yeah. okay bante thank yeah. you very much yeah. i understood it very well yeah thank you yeah yeah okay thank you uh, i would like to invite yasua uh, thank you bante for for the time to address my question um but i am i'm i'm kind of uh, would like to talk about a bit on the the state of mind i would say now in day to day sometimes i see my there are thoughts coming into my mind and i'm able to see them and watch them and then most of them come and disappear there there may be some things that i need to do um but bante over the time i have kind of uh, seen the pattern in the sense there are some thoughts i say most of them are likes like sensual uh i know that it is coming somehow i can see even i can watch it but i can also see i'm acting on that <laughs> yeah. sometimes uh, <laughs> yeah i i would have preferred not to mm-hmm. i would have rather prefer to come and let it go but it doesn't happen <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah so so i am kind of thinking maybe one day i will but i just wanted to share that yes yeah. so that's true because our uh, internal habits so habitual tendencies are still very strong even though we understand dhamma even though we have even practiced to some extent but still these thoughts quickly compel us to an action so we can't stop it because that's things it. are yeah compel yes. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> so we have to further work on it <laughs> now at least we understand the situation that's the good thing because typically what happen is Correct. we were ignorantly doing the whole thing ignorantly following our desires and we we didn't have any perspective about it now at least we know i mean these things are there i understand its fruitless nature but still i am subjected to it so i have some better op- position better uh, potential to further refine my practice yeah. and further develop my understanding so that in a, at another future occasion i am not being sort of uh, governed by that not being followed by that yes but that is for yeah. because i have kind of i wouldn't say identified but i have seen a pattern i know that the, hmm. the area where 
sometimes I lose that control. Yeah. Uh, but as you said, yes, I can at least see it now. Maybe yeah. eventually it might yeah, to yes. the next step. <laughs> correct, correct. So Buddha emphasized Thank you, Buddha. Panyaya Diswa Diswa Pahatabba. Yeah. So he he mentioned that Panyaya Diswa Pahatabba. Or else sometimes he called Panyaya Diswa Asava Parikkina Hunti. So by seeing things through the wisdom, so all that past habits, latent tendencies are being slowly faded away. Yes. So understanding, Thank you, yeah, Thank you understanding their presence, their operation is very, very important. Then only we have a possibility to abandon them. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Bante. Yeah. Okay. okay. I think we have come to the end of the sit, uh, Sorry, session. Bante. Yeah. There's actually a, a, a written question here. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, it says, Therun Sane Bhante, does this wholesome equanimity mean a Dukkama Sukha Vedana? Uh, we can't say so either because this is, uh, this is fairly a Dukkama Sukha. I agree with you. But uh, you know, uh, when we are talking uh, Vedana, pressurable feelings, painful feelings, equanimous feelings, equanimous feelings are there. But when we are talking this wholesome equanimity or uh, the equanimity to all the formations, it may has the feeling torn of this Adukkama Sukha Vedana. But more than that, it has the wisdom coming through the practice. So it is not merely, we are not here merely talking the Adukkama Sukha Vedana. Here we are talking more uh, understanding based equanimity. So you become understood, you understood the true nature of things and as a result of that you maintain equanimity without uh, being burned by them, without being interfered by them, because you understood their true nature. So you have become dispassionate about them, you are now maintaining distance from them, because you understood their true nature. So this is the equanimity we are, what we are talking. Thank you, Bhante. That was the last of the questions. Okay. Then I like to conclude the today's session. And we have spent uh, one and a half hours discussing the Dhamma, shortly practicing as well as uh, listening to the Dhamma. And all the merits what we have accumulated, we share with all the celestial beings, with all the past relatives, and whoever in need of merits. And we wish these merits help us also to understand the Buddha's teaching, practice it to the best of our ability and to attain path fruition nibbana we will recite the traditional verses etavata cha amhe hi sambhatam punya sampadam sambhe devan monatu sambha sampatti sinya etavata cha amhe hi sambhatam punya sampadam sambhe bhutan monatu sambha sampatti sinya etavata cha amhe hi sambhatam punya sampadam Sabbe satta namodantu sabbe sampatti siddhya Aka sakta chabhumatta deva naga mahiddika Punyam tanga namoditva chiram nakantu sasnam Aka sakta chabhumatta deva naga mahiddika Punyam tanga namoditva chiram nakantu desnam Aka sakta chabhumatta deva naga mahiddika Punyam tang and aboded vajaram rakam to mankaram. Idang bona tinang ho to sukita hun to na teo. Idang bona tinang ho to sukita hun to na teo. Idang bona tinang ho to sukita hun to na teo. Imina punya kame ne mame balas magamo. Satang smagamo ho to yavane bana patia. Imina punya kame na ma me balas magamo, Satang samagamo ho tu yavanibana patia. Imina punya kame na ma me balas magamo, Satang samagamo ho tu yavanibana patia. Sadu, sadu, sadu. Thank you, Bantidon Sanai. Yeah, Tedon Sanai.